Ah, here we are. Um, I do hope you all had a great week. Uh, picking up a question, uh, revisiting, I guess is the best word, talking about site size again. I referred at one point to site size, and if you've seen my videos on drawing, there are various discussions about the site size, but it, I tr primarily talk about site size in the context of the um, uh, of the way people are using it as a device for measuring, for doing what some people then would call comparative drawing. Uh, I just learned this week, I had a visit from a young woman who's uh, interested in studying, and she's, she said, I'm, we do comparative drawing, and I said, well, what is that? And um, because comparative, you know, to me, comparative means you're comparing, say, <laughs> it means this to that, you know. But in fact, she said, we make the size of the object the same sizes on our drawing, as we, and then we take the other parts and make those the same size. And try. So it's a transferring process by size, if I understood it correctly. And that's a thing that's rather like sight size, uh, or in the same family as sight size. But only sight size is a method, not sight size as a place on the floor. And um, so let me talk about, let me read the question. Here we are. Uh, this is from my friend RM, who has been in my uh, intensives a couple times. Is it three times now? So I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, I'm tempted to say your real name, but I will leave, <laughs> leave it with the way you like it. Um, so let me get this up on the big screen, the slideshow level screen. And, um, and RM says, I pose a question for you about your definition of sight size as just a place on the floor. I remember reading about the Slade School drawing as, as drawing at the size the eye sees and noticing the fact that much of the old master drawings are quite small, so they were quite aware of the felt size through their eyes. Walter Sickard mentions this as well as others. Recently, I read the illustrator Robert Fawcett's Slade School strained, Trained. I think Sickert was, was maybe too. And he too mentions the drawing sight size uh, not how the ateliers use it, to avoid the mathematical proportionate sizing that's counterintuitive to the eye. That, this got me thinking, do you use the place on the floor in that way? Are you drawing the size from that distance or is it more mathematical, as in pick a top and bottom and then figure out the size of the shapes based on that? I, you're saying to that, sh to that proportion, so based on that. So if so, why not draw the, site, the size seen? given that seems to be the most difficult natural eye-brain connection. Curious about your take. I watched your site size videos and the questions still remained, plus it felt relevant given my new faucet readings. So I didn't answer that question, but I wanted to do this video because I, I think clarity is really possible here. I mean, really, really, we can, be, we can really nail it this time, which is why, by the way, I like your coming back at me with your questions, your discussion points. The interesting thing is the beginning of this question. Uh, I remember, uh, the, well, let's see what he says, the felt size through their eyes. So let me, let me um, <laughs> actually, let me show you some images first because I'm no big fan of the Slade School. <laughs> um, first of all, Michelangelo, let's talk about, let's start from the beginning here. Michelangelo, there's, there are many drawings by Michelangelo that are very small. And they are um, uh, at, at the Gardner Museum, if you wanted to find them, there, there's, there are doors, uh, you know, with behind glass, there are these drawings. And uh, quite a few Michelangelo's and quite a few of them are very small. I'll bring you this one of my own um, to give you an idea. I mean, now this is not, this is an imaginative drawing. This is drawing out of the. Um, I've got trying to remember what, how I should show, how, how I drew this. <laughs> At any rate, you can see this drawing here. I'm just I'll bring it as close as I can. So these these couple drawings. I'm hoping you can see them. Let's see. Am I too low? Too high? There we go. All right. These are my drawings, and this is the size I work. I work between this size, which is about five or six inches in height, to as much as 
eight or 10 inches in height when I'm doing a figure out of my imagination. I find it very convenient to be sitting there in a chair, which is usually when I'm doing that kind of doodling. <laughs> I sit in a chair and I just draw that size. So that doesn't mean he was drawing from life uh, when he did those things. So you might want to consider that possibility. So Michelangelo's drawings are often as much as a foot high, the one I frequently show you that I really like showing, uh, which is one of my favorites of all time, which is the Libyan Sybil at the Metropolitan, I think is a drawing as much as 13 inches. The, draw, the paper itself, I think, is in the drawing. So the drawing is somewhere, the figure is somewhere in that size. So that doesn't allow him to be painting. I mean, if he's holding it on his lap, he would be drawing way bigger than life size. So my guess is at that point, he's not drawing on his lap, it's out there somewhere. We used to draw a little draw. Uh, I'm trying to finish off this Michelangelo thing and then get on to the question of, of how it relates to how big the drawing is. But the first part of it is there's all kinds of ways, uh, all kinds of drawings, and some of, you know, multiples of which are just, you're making them up out of your head. And so when I'm drawing out of my head, sometimes I draw on my lap, sometimes I draw standing up and further back. Uh, so they have nothing to do with the size of any any sitter. And I don't know how many of Michelangelo's works are done from sitters. They look like they might be done from imagination. I mean, his in, in some cases, like the one I'm showing you now, uh, the one on the left, that could very well. Be, I mean, it looks it looks wrong, right? It looks too thin. The figure looks too thin uh, for its length. And um, by the way, this is a marvelous example of how he virtually sculpts, Michelangelo virtually sculpts. He's giving you a sense of a third dimension in the most striking way here uh, as a bas-relief. Some people then use that as a discussion of what drawing ought to be, you know, this idea of the bas-relief, but it really gets a sense of the third dimension. But to finish that off, so was he painting from life? Was he not painting from life? This becomes a big question. When you get to the Slade School, these drawings now from Robert Fawcett look like, these look like drawings that were done in the classroom with posed models. And if they say what they're doing is, is, is drawing the thing sort of side by side, so it appears to be about the same size, I would say to you, that's what we do as well. That's what I do. I don't but if I find myself, or if I find students matching, transferring widths and that sort of thing, just drawing the size by transfer, instead of seeing proportionally, then I myself will quit doing it. I'll move it into a different size relationship, so I can't do that. And I tell students not to do it. So that's one, that's one factor here. These guys, and I, by the way, I, I'm not a fan of the slate school. Their drawings look really bad frequently. They remind me of what the, the worst of what you see coming out of the Ashcan people. And I don't mean the best, but, the, but there's a sort of a standard that isn't really a high one where the figure is a little bit arbitrary. You're sort of drawing and having a nice time, sort of using the model sitting there, but you're just sort of making up your own figure. Well, that's fine. I, I'm not picking on it, but... What I'll show you right now is the Degas uh, mentality. And that is wildly different, isn't it? This is what I call discipline drawing. <laughs> the guys, don't, the heads don't look off size. You know, everything looks really remarkably, as it were, measured. Let's go back. Here's, here's, uh, here's Henry Tonks, who's the teacher of Fawcett, or maybe not, by the way. But he's, he does these drawings that have these remarkable sort of feelings of being poorly seen and undisciplined. Uh, you can look at it and decide for yourself. The, the articulation of this area here looks, looks like it's in that category. It's not convincing. It's, now, of course, I'm talking about Degas. It's one, we do consider him for reasons possibly related to this. One of the great draftsmen of all time. So that's, you know, would you say that's an unfair comparison? I don't know, because I think that possibly what's happening is is that these guys are simply more, he's simply more disciplined than these guys. So here are a couple more by Fawcett now, and you can see that they look a little wrong in key ways. Now this one looks like it's wrong because look, I say wrong, not really wrong, but it looks like he's sitting too close to the model. And that leg winds up being huge. Um, and, but that's, you know, so what? Uh, but this one actually doesn't look right. It looks wrong in lots of ways. It doesn't look like, it's not convincing. And again, I want to just give you a view again of the Degas uh, as our standard. Look how convincing these things are. 
All of them, even when you go to these guys, they look like the heads are the right size for the bodies. This is what I call disciplined drawing. So I'm doing this to just simply point out that, that you can talk that way sort of loosely about making it the life size. And I'm going to tell you now that it is, life, it is sight size the way I work. But I don't do sight size. And that's what you really want to know is, do I do sight size? Well, I work sight size mostly but I never transfer widths. I don't look for it to be a size that I see there. I'm, I'm looking relationally. So if you remember that seeing is seeing relationally, that's the definition of seeing. Seeing is seeing relationally. You'll find that, you'll find that quoted numerous times through, through, through different uh, painters who talk about it. But if, if seeing is seeing relationally, then we're talking about measurements. We're talking about how big is this to that? So what I, what I then do is I draw the way it looks, I have a nice time of it, and I, and I see something funny, and I note whether or not that's a proportion problem, what it is, you know. And if it is, then I observe that more carefully, and I say, well, well that's, that, it, that width is wrong for that length. But I tell, always tell my students to measure after, to check measurements after. With gamma, we would draw, we would set up top and bottom, and some people would then say, and then Gamble would have you mark the center and the quarters and things like that. He didn't with us. He didn't with me. He simply had us draw, and he would notice whether or not halves and quarters, or in other words, proportions were accurate. He would make a point of saying, don't you see these aren't accurate? Here, let me show you. Here, take the quarters uh, paper. Just hold the quarters up there. You'll see they're not, your marks aren't on. And so that's a way of checking your eye, but I don't want anybody having to draw by measurements. I think that's, I think that's where I'm really going to be, you're going to find me different from other people. But I still re re respect the truth. I still want my stuff to be convincing. And I'm talking about the proportions. So here's a Robert Fawcett, perfectly nice drawings, but if you look at them, they, well, now this one, again, you're, you're just so close to the figure, you get that, get that dwindling thing I showed you in my own painting last week just too close to the legs, so you get a deformity. If you want that, fine. But, but parts of this just don't look right. They look, you know, this looks like a drawing that wasn't well seen. Again, I want to refer you to Degas. Look at, the, look at how that you don't get those feelings. And these are, these are, uh, these are school drawings. I mean, let us say he was barely out of school, and these are, well, so these are in the class of what I call schooled. And he's working on a very high standard. Maybe it's just French drawing versus English, but I don't think so. I'm, I, I'm wrong if I say that. But the, the convincing, they're just plain convincing in their size relationships. <laughs> so, again, I'm going to show you. This is, this is Augustus John, who Gamma loved to call Disgustus John. <laughs> but he does these remarkably beautiful, aesthetically beautiful drawings of heads. I mean, they're as nice as drawing gets, probably, in one sense. They're really, really beautiful. And then he goes to do the figure, and he's got that same problem that the other guys, at, and by the way, this is another Slade guy, is why I pick him. But then he goes, and then he, and by the way, he embodies the long line that Sargent talks about and a few other things. And then he goes and does the figure, and, you know, he does this kind of curious stuff, like why in the heck is he so unconvincing. And that's, I mean, that's a noticeably unconvincing drawing. Now, again, <laughs> it's possible he's sitting, looking, way, he's too close to the model, looking right up at her, her head's shrinking, so maybe this is an accurate drawing. But he, somebody should have told them at the sleigh that they need to stand back a bit to avoid those kind of deformities. You, it, the difficulty I find in sitting so close to a model in the first place is that you can't see the thing as a whole, so you might want to consider that problem. But there's just, you know, when you're looking at these and many of the other figures, they just don't come together in the same way. They're, as I say, they're unschooled, they're undisciplined. And that's the distraction for me at the Slade School. So I'm now picking on the Slade School, and I apologize to all you guys uh, who may be from there or other things. But, but I just really want to suggest to you that sight size, sight size is a place on the floor that is commonly used. It, and that way, it's reasonable as just exactly the way um, um, RM says, it's really reasonable to consider drawing about the size you see things. It's just easier to, to, to draw it when it's side by side. The reason is because when it's the same size, you can actually see how you're off. 
it's more noticeable how you're off. But the just but 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 as I said, if you if you see a problem and you don't know that it's okay to check a proportion, read the proportion on the models. You can find you can. So, so I've said to the student, the ruler is your, in other words, the the proportion checker is your teacher. It's a good teacher. It's a very good one, and a checker in any case. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, largely I agree with you. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go and look at the uh, quote again. So, um, so mat mathematical proportional sizing counterintuitive to the eye. Proportions are what you're doing when you're drawing. If you're not drawing proportions, proportions are mathematical. So you're not always doing proportions no matter what. Obviously, you're not going to get a likeness. So I don't know how the mathematical proportional sizing, unless there's some method that somebody was promoting in those days, like measuring first, which I completely uh, suggest uh, suggest we don't do. The only thing I do is tell you to pick a size of the of the thing you're going to draw, so that you have something to see the proportions of. So if you're doing my head, the location of my eyes is a function of that distance. Everybody, everybody gets that, right? And you won't find even the guys like, um, you know, the uh, Disgustus Johns and those guys, they won't be missing the proportions, the locations of the, of the eyes in the face. And they won't be doing it. They'll be doing it in some sense. They will have learned things about that, right? So that, that, like, like Leonardo talks about things you should learn, that, you know, and it might have to do with thirds, you know, that thirds thing or something. But that's just a, also, that's just a checker too, admittedly. You know, it's a proportion that we, we might say is given in nature. But it's just a, something to check. So uh, this got me thinking, do you use the place on the floor that way? Yes, the answer is I absolutely use the place on the floor. And when I'm drawing, now when, I, when I'm drawing in my lap, I just draw so I can see the thing as a whole easily. So if I'm drawing down here, just draw something at the table in front of me. I just want to make sure that I'm I'm not so too close to it to see my proportions. And so, but if I'm drawing on an easel, I can stand back farther. This is all the imaginative world. But when you're drawing from life, you can do the same thing. You can draw on your lap and make it the the apparent size, so that if you were to hold it up, it would appear to be the same size, and thereby check it. That's the value of sight size. There's no value. The comparative thing is not, you're not going to learn to draw. Drawing is, see, seeing is seeing relationally. But drawing is a relational game. Drawing is the relationships of things. So, um, and I've been talking about mathematics with the heights. They're either right or wrong, right? <laughs> so, uh, are, you drawing this, are, are you drawing the size from the distance is more mathematical? as? But that's where we don't agree. The mathematical is not pick a top and bottom and figure out the size of the shapes to that proportion. It is do a top and bottom, yes, but then just draw. Just have a good time drawing, but just pick up top and bottom. But you're always drawing in proportion. So there's nothing more. It's not mathematical. It's reactive. And I'm always telling people, draw. please draw intuitively. Draw intuitively. Draw until it feels right. In fact, learn to see it by feel. Get a feeling for where a thing lands. That's what I recommend, and that is not a sight size mechanical process. Um, but be ready to check it. Be ready to be to be disciplined to be a disciplined draft, draftsman, as I suggest to you. Degas absolutely is. Uh, by the way, you've read that about Degas, how he was a stickler. His models, his one model, wrote about him and talked about how painful it was to pose for him because he would get so irritated if she didn't hold the pose, and said how bad at models he was when she was young. <laughs> this is a as she was an older woman working for him. Um, so if so, why not draw the sight scene? Yeah, so I do draw the sight scene. I do draw the size that I see from this distance. I typically do. I've, and I would agree with you that it's a default. Your next point is it's a default. I agree that it is, and that's why I do it. I find it far easier to draw approximately the same size as what's there, but I don't do anything by way of trying to assume that this size, therefore, is that size and that sort of thing. I'm still a proportional draftsman. That is to say, a relational draftsman. Everything I do is a function of something else. Every angle is a function of other angles, and every size is a function of other sizes. And the trick, shall we say, is the guy who measures the most. By the way, Gamble said the cure for measuring is more measuring. But if he means to measure first, that's problematical to me. In fact, what I said to Gamble, or said to myself, <laughs> in the face of Gamble, I never did have the nerve to say it to Gamble. I didn't want to get thrown out, but who knows? 
But I said to myself, well, then I'm going to just measure more than you, but I'm not going to do it that way. Meaning the mechanical way you're probably talking about. So I then said, well, then how am I going to win? And the answer was, I, I wanted to make sure that Gamble came in the room and he couldn't find proportional problems in my pictures. But I was only doing relational drawing. I only drew how this felt, this height felt, when I looked at something else and something else and something else. And when, it sized, when I saw it sized to multiple things, and that's the forbidden knowledge conversation, which if you haven't heard that from me before, ask me for the little document it's called forbidden knowledge. But it's just simply about, like in a courtroom, how you determine who's telling the truth. So you're, you're, you're seeing this size as a function of multiple sizes around, and those sizes have to be right to each other. That's our game, and that's done intuitively by feel. Uh, but it's still drawing by, by proportion, if you like to put it that way. But it's not drawing, it's not proportioning first, it's not measuring first. It's all done by the pleasure of the, of the, of the intuitive, the felt. So, um, curious about your take. I watched your sight size videos, so the question still remains. So, yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're just bringing me into a very fine point, and I really appreciate this, RM. Uh, I hope I've come close to responding to you in a reasonable way. I made a note to myself somewhere in here. I'm not going to show you these my notes, but I'm going to glance at these for a second. <laughs> I've talked about Michelangelo's size. I've talked about drawing intuitively, only measuring after. I've talked about, uh, oh, so one thing I didn't talk about is that proportions are ascertainable facts. They really are. So as I said, if you have a distance from a head to a chin, and you know that, it, it, and if certain parts of the eye lands in the middle of that thing, it's a real thing. You can't get out of it. There's no way to avoid it. And therefore, you can also check it. You can actually read it on a, if you hold up a ruler with a halfway mark, just go from one to two, to, well, from zero to one to two, you just hold that up and read where one lands on, in the nature. Yours should land in the same place, right? That's merely a checker, though. Now, you certainly ought to be observing where it lands, by, but you do it by feel. Um, so, but proportions are certainly ascertainable facts and, in fact, measurable to significant degrees. Harder to measure certain kinds of things than others. Even the idea of the clock, you know, somebody says the hour hand to get the angle to vertical, that's a measurement, right? The, that's a calculus. You're actually predisposing your mind to grasp the angle relationship to vertical. Now, so you can, you can say that. You could even hold up a ruler. Some people tell you to do it. And you can. You can hold up a device, if you like, make sure it's plumb, and then read the angle. Say it's between two points, or just the long angle of, of, an, of, a, of an arm. You still have to find two points. But those things are always being done by you anyway. You're observing what the angle is of any mass in the drawing. I've got to get this up here. But you're observing this angle, and all I'm asking you to do is get it right to vertical and get it right to other angles, which means you're measuring. <laughs> it's intuitive, yeah, but... You know, don't make this more than it is. We always draw by feel with our eyes. And I'm always telling people, please draw with your eyes. Don't draw with your rulers. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Now, one other point I could make to you is, and this is just a little follow-on with the uh, discussion of uh, these guys. So when you're doing working in a classroom, you're studying the figure. And I would expect the teacher to be really quite close to you, trying to really say, don't you see that how remarkably off that is? You know, say a size, like this head size here, it appears to be way tiny. Again, I can't tell it's how, how, how much this is about that we're, they were sitting too close to the model, which tells you that you don't have a very good classroom, certainly not one that comes up to Leonardo's standards. Uh, so the but the but the head does noticeably appear small here. Well, that's the sort of thing that a teacher should be able to say to you, and he should also be able to prove it to you by taking a reading like one. You know, people will tell you that a figure is seven heads high or something. Well, you should be able to set a mark on certain places and read, even if it's not a trying to figure out how many heads there are in a figure. You should be able to note any size. You could be talking about my hand and notice how many of of this width, say from here to the top of this finger, how many of those there are to get down here. You can notice things like that. Some people tell you to get a little stick and do it like, 
I would never tell you to do that. That's pre-measuring. That's measuring first. That's proportional measuring first, and I don't approve of any of that stuff. I paint it. I draw intuitively. So anyway, but th so that's a so he's drawing from life here, and you can see how I would say compared to God, this is really undisciplined. But but then when you start drawing figures for uh, paintings, you know when you're just making stuff up. You know, people can use the figure and draw that way. Just, you know, you can just loosely use the figure. But if you're studying the figure, that's one of the things I don't understand why one would ever do in a classroom. You would expect the student to, and I'm, I don't see any actually, you'd expect the, the student to be a real, uh, uh, um, to be involved in real discipline. You expect the teacher to be coming in and saying, don't you see? It's not like that, it's like this. So when you're making a figure up out of your head, as I said before, showing you these drawings that I have here, you're going to be off a thousand ways. Nobody's not going to hurt anybody. <laughs> Show it to you this way this time. But, um, but and and I and I don't I don't do any of those drawings with pre-measuring. Those things are just done by feel. Now what I'm trying to use it, I don't like the way it, it somehow or other when you paint it out there, it doesn't feel right. You want to recheck. You might want to you might want to bring a model in even and ask questions to the model. The model has similar proportions. Now that doesn't apply if you're making a figure like a Greek head or something like that. You just use the proportions that you've learned about the Greeks. So um, let's see if there's anything else. Um, hmm. Yeah, yeah, so I think I've covered it. I think I've covered it, RM. I, I, I want to share this quote with you. Out of that, You can find it in Wikipedia if you look up uh, of uh, Augustus John, again, who Gamble referred to as Disgustus John. It, but they say for a time, oh, this is from Virginia Woolf, she said, Virginia Woolf remarked that by 1908, the era of John Singer Sargent was over and the age of Augustus John was dawning. And I, you know, if you look at the paintings by, by Augustus John, I mean, they're remarkably not good. Tonks, I mean, all these guys, they just, the undiscipline is so striking. Now, why am I picking on that, RM? Because I really want you to think about borrowing from millionaires when you're, I mean, those ideas, they can be out there. People can say, well, I just do this or we just do that. But look at their work, you know, when you're borrowing from guys. You know, look at the work, are you borrowing from a millionaire? And do you, is that what you're after, you know? And again, notice the difference between drawings done for different purposes. I think I'm done. <laughs> That was a good cup of coffee. All right, so thank you all again for your likes, uh, sharing, uh, subscribing. Still haven't heard from uh, Mr. Producer on the subject of when, uh, but he wants to do something fairly uh, elaborate uh, next time with our, um, with our live one. So he's always got interesting ideas, appreciate him. Um, but I think we've covered everything. Um, I hope I didn't miss something here. Um, RM. And uh, in the meantime, please uh, have a great drawing week again, painting week. Uh, I'd love to meet with you at the next one. <laughs>